Hey, you are listening to Oh Crap Parenting with me, your host, Jamie Gorlacki. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, hey, you guys. Welcome, welcome. Today, I'm very excited because I'm going to be chatting with Sarah Kleiner of Sarah Kleiner Wellness, and she is a certified nutrition and quantum health coach, and we will talk about what the hell that means in a minute. <laughs> I'm going to let Sarah introduce herself and tell how she got here. I have been following Sarah for a very long time on Instagram, um, back when she was carnivore, and the carnivore diet did well for her for a while and then did not, and so she changed tactics, but her story is wonderful. So Sarah, why don't you jump in and let everybody know a bit about yourself? Well, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk to you and your community and just a whole new group of people. Cause I think it's so exciting to really spread this information and, and kind of help people understand how this stuff works on a very basic level for our own health and for our kids' health. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I did start off my whole social media in 2019, kind of as a joke. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was teaching yoga at the time. I had been teaching yoga since 2012, I believe 2011, somewhere around there. And I had started doing the carnivore diet because I was having so many issues with my gut, joint pain, skin problems. And it was all kind of coming to a head. I had just turned 40 and I was like, uh, or I was about 39 at the time when I started. And it was just like, what in the world? And so um, it was like, okay, I'm going to go to a functional medicine doctor, spend all this money on testing and labs, or I could just try this diet and see if it helps. And it really did. I mean, it was like, Remarkable. And so I started my whole social media as a joke because um, I was the carnivore yogi. Cause it's like, right. Yoga is like more associated with vegan. Who's like not going to stop their scroll when they see that? Like, what? Cause like, aren't yogis supposed to be vegetarian, vegan? And I was for years and it just, it wrecked my body, you know? Um, that's a whole other topic conversation. I'm not going to go yeah. deeply into that. Well, and I, think, I, I was thinking this morning too, is like, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric online about like these extreme diets. And I think people don't realize that most of us try carnivore because we weren't getting answers from standard Desperate. medical. Yeah. Desperate. And like we had all these things for me, it was debilitating arthritis. Yeah. Yes. And that's the, the people that I have. I started, um, working with people all over the world uh, because my page picked up a bunch of steam. I had already, I already had some nutrition certifications and had been working with clients one-on-one -on -one since 2012. So I wasn't new to working with people. But when I started sharing my story online about the dramatic health improvements I was having from this diet, there was people just coming out of the woodwork with debilitating pain, with arthritis, with autoimmune conditions, gut issues. I mean, and it continues, right? People mm -hmm. are still suffering with a lot of these problems and the, the diet can, I, it can be helpful. And I still do recommend it to people to be used for periods of time. Mm -hmm. Um, at a certain point, we want to get people healthy and resilient enough so that they can tolerate other foods. That's where circadian biology and quantum biology enter the picture because it gives you a model of health, um, that addresses your entire lifestyle and the ability of your mitochondria to be healthy and for your cells to hold a negative charge. All of those things are going to help you when it comes to what foods you can tolerate and not. And uh, so, yeah, it was a big learning experience for me because I had amazing benefits from the diet. And then after about a year, I started, you know, everything wasn't so perfect anymore. And I started being like, oh, maybe my hormones and my thyroid aren't super optimal. And I wanted to have another baby. I had always wanted to have another baby. My daughter, Alexis, she is 16 and a half now. Um, she'll be 17 in, in December. Oh, uh, I know she's crazy. She's, <laughs> she's as big as I am. Yeah. Uh, and she ha was diagnosed with uh, non-speaking autism. She had a severe regression. Um, that's a whole other story as well. <laughs> when she was we'll have part two and part three <laughs> it's like there's like so much but <laughs> had this severe regression lost all of her speech language eye contact and so raising her and you know of course doctors everyone's like we've never seen this before you know all these challenges she was having I was just being told by expert after expert like oh sorry I don't really know what to tell you to do here or they would give me stuff to do and it would go really badly um, and so it's hard. I mean, it's raising kids is hard period. 
But Alexis just presented well, a lot of challenges and I had to deal with my own personal demons. And so I always wanted a second child, but it was like, oh, okay, when things get easier with her, we'll have the, the next baby, we'll have the next baby. And it just never got easier. Um, and so around 2020, I had been doing carnivore for a good solid year or so then. We had the pandemic and, and you know, we're home as a family and we're like, you know what, it's time. Like I turned 40 in 2019 and I was 41. I'm like, it. we got to have this baby. If we're going to have another baby. Yeah, now we or never. <laughs> it's good time is ticking. Like there's a, there's like a biological order to things and we are about to run out of time. Um, and so, you know, I'm thinking I've been doing carnivore. I've been strict. I haven't had any processed foods. I've been doing, you know, this will be easy. And I did get pregnant quickly. Um, unfortunately I experienced pregnancy loss and another pregnancy loss and it's devastating. I had never really been through that before with my daughter. It was like, you get pregnant, you get the positive test and it's like, you're okay. We're having a baby. Um, and so this is like a whole new thing and a whole new world that I was, um, kind of understanding was infertility and what a major issue it was and how many women struggle with not only infertility, but secondary infertility is where you've had, you know, a good healthy pregnancy, but you're struggling to get pregnant with another baby after having healthy pregnancies. And it's such a major issue for people. Um, and you know, I had the, this thinking of like, I've been carnivore, uh, this will be easy. Right. And it wasn't. And so, you know, I dove Did you into, get brushed off a lot because of your age? I did, you know, and of course my doctors, my, my, got my standard gynecologist, and then I end up going to fertility doctor. They're just like, because you're 41, um, this is like, it's just going to be hard for you to get pregnant because after you turn 40, the chances of you getting pregnant go down like exponentially. And this is going to be really hard. And I was told at the IVF clinic, like, you know, you're probably going to have to do five or six rounds of this. Um, and it may not even work. You might want to look at donor eggs. And I was just like, Whoa, I wasn't expecting this, you know? Um, but yeah, it's a thing a lot of women deal with. And a lot of women get so caught up, you know, with me, I was caught up with Alexis and raising a special needs child and all the challenges that come with that, the sleepless nights, the stress, the multiple therapists, the, the school system, like just all of it, you know, and my own personal grief and own demons that all popped up for me to deal with. Right. Um, and so, but a lot of women get caught in career and they get caught in life and they're like, okay, well now I'm finally quote unquote in a place to have the baby and they're in their late thirties, early forties, and they can't get pregnant. Um, so it's a big, and, and, but here's the other thing. When I was in the fertility clinic going through the whole IVF thing, it was not only women my age. I maybe saw one or two other women my age. I mainly saw women in their 20s and 30s in the in the clinic, which was shocking to me. Um, yeah. I mean, it, when we're talking about hormones, I'm, it, there's a whole cascade of things like that shock me. The amount of women who are going through perimenopause so young and for so oh, long and having horrible yeah. symptoms and it's... Yeah, our hormones are fucked. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. insane. Ever like in the whole perimenopause thing right now, kind of like gets under my skin a little bit. Because it's not a part of the female reproductive cycle. That's why it gets under your skin. It's like it's a word that came out and now everybody like uses it, but it's really not part of our cycle. Yeah. It's no. not like and Sorry. It is I'm like, like ranting against it now. <laughs> are are supposed to shift as we age. They are supposed to shift yeah, and change. Yeah. Um but we're not supposed to suffer the way that women are suffering right now. Right. Uh, and that's what drives me crazy is like, I'm four, I just turned 45. I still have, you know, painless 28 day cycles. Um, and that's not by accident. I don't suffer with horrible mood swings and hot flashes and all of those things, anxiety, yeah, yeah. depression, that I do see a lot of women struggling with. So I'm not wanting to sit here and say that women are making things up and it's all in their head. Yeah. They are oh, having, yeah, no, yeah, no, I didn't these I mean, issues. I, didn't I know mean you didn't mean that, yeah. <laughs> but just for anybody listening, like, I don't want to come off that way. Cause I know that women are definitely struggling, but you, I don't know the amount of women that I've worked with in my community, 
that have overcome these issues in their forties and fifties. And I've seen women just kind of like sail into menopause. Like I didn't have a period for 12 months, but I didn't have hot flashes, mood sw- I didn't, I didn't suffer right. through this phase of my life. I was able to go into it and through it gracefully. I've seen that at this point, hundreds of times, um, because these women are mm-hmm. dialed in and yeah, we ha- there's a lot of fear around perimenopause and menopause. And I think if you have the right strategies, it doesn't have to be so horrible. You don't want to suffer. Um, yeah. Suffer. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. No, I'll be 56 this year. And it's like just fading off into the distance. It's, <laughs> you know, I haven't gone 12 months yet, but it's, uh, it's definitely going just away. No hot flashes, no waking, no brain fog, none of the typical symptoms. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Cause you know, you know, you are taking care of yourself and that's a true testament to uh, your nutrition and lifestyle and things that you're doing to take care. Yeah. Of let's get into that because quantum health sounds so scary. I remember like seeing it, maybe you like, you know, a lot of people are talking about it. And I remember like having a visceral, like, shh, like I was on an electric fence. Cause it just reminds me of like quantum physics. And I was like, I don't know what quantum health is, but I, uh, like, I'm not going to get it. <laughs> Um, and so why don't you go into that and circadian biology? Cause that's what I think is so like, so helpful for kids. And there's just so many basic things we could be doing that can radically shift everything. Yeah. yeah and it's basically like it, the quant, when I t- I'm talking about quantum health and quantum biology in this kind of frame of reference, I'm talking about making these little small changes to support your mitochondria, to select your, to, to really support your body on this bioelectrical, uh, kind of a model, because we often are looking at the body through a biochemical model. And that's what I was doing with fertility, with IVF, with all this stuff is like, I'm measuring my hormones and I'm going to supplement this and get this result out. I'm going to do this and get this result out. And I was completely, I didn't understand circadian biology, quantum biology, and how these little signals that we can send our bodies through the day um, and in our lifestyle can create huge changes and shifts in our uh, in our mitochondrial health. And everyone's so caught up on the genetic model and genes, but mitochondria really run the show more so, I think, than genetics. Now, yeah, genetics are going to get expressed when your mitochondria begin to function poorly. Your body is making less energy, less cellular water. So genes do get expressed in that case. But um, And what's the one takeaway from high school biology? The mitochondria uh, is the powerhouse of the cell. cell right, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So we make ATP, which is energy, right? And so mitochondria uh, and the health of your mitochondria essentially are how well does your body make energy um, and how well can you process energy, which would be food, sunlight, all these things are energy inputs for your body. And uh, I think that poor mitochondrial health is really a major root cause and, and loss of cellular water, cellular hydration is a major root cause of a lot of our health issues. Um, and it was Dr. Jack Cruz. He came on my podcast back in, uh, 2021 and he was basically the one. And, you know, I was doing this thing with my podcast back in 2021, when I was trying to get pregnant, every guest I had on my hidden agenda was to talk to them off camera about their thought on like why I couldn't get pregnant. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, everyone was so kind and I had so many amazing people that offered me amazing advice and like really helpful. Like Dr. Kiltz was one of them. He's mm-hmm. a big carnivore influencer. Now he talked to me on the phone multiple times. Um, just like the, it's one of the kindest people I will still tell, tell everyone. Dr. Kiltz is one of the kindest people I've ever talked to in my life. Um, you know, but his thing was just like, basically like carnivore harder, do more fasting, you know? And I was like, I'm, I just don't think that's the ticket for me. Mm-hmm. And what Dr. Cruz told me was that I needed to study leptin and I needed to study light circadian biology. And he kind of threw me into this rabbit hole. So Cruz got me started on the path. And then I began to connect with others in that community. My, my friend and colleague, uh, Carrie Bennett, we have a podcast together called quantum conversations. Um, Dr. Corey Gasvini, those two were very instrumental for me understanding and applying this information because Cruz can be really confusing and a bit off-putting, let's face it. Um, 
I just yeah. heard somebody talk about him on a podcast and say that it's like trying to sip water from a fire hydrant. Like his knowledge, the way he like, it's a lot. Him. It's yeah. a lot. To, it's hard to understand. The average person can't decipher what he's saying or read his blogs. There's he's put out a ton of great information, but it can be hard to sift through and understand. And so Carrie and Dr. Gasvini were my go-to people. And I also uh, was in the first cohort of the quantum biology collective um, coaching program. So I was certified in levels one and two, and I'm actually sitting for my board exams tomorrow to be okay. board certified in uh, applied quantum biology. So I'm studying today and tomorrow for that. Oh, and uh, nice. Yeah. And, and Cruz is not involved in that at all. And, you know, so he got me started. I have to give him credit for that. But a lot of what I've learned and applied has been from these other teachers that I've had in my life, Dr. Gerald Pollack, Veda Austin. I mean, there's so many amazing people that are putting out really tremendous, wonderful work that I've taken and applied on myself and with, with clients. Um, but, you know, for your average person who's listening, like, what does this mean? What does this entail? Uh, every single cell and organ system in your body has a circadian clock in front of it, including your, your hormones, right? Our, our hormones all go on a circadian clock. Um, the and explain part. circadian because I think most people understand circadian rhythm and respect to sleep, but mm -hmm. talk about like just the word circadian for a sec. Yeah, I mean, just that it's a 24 hour ish cycle that our body is meant to run on and it's okay. meant to be timed up with light and dark cycles, respectively, like where you live. Now, of course, if you live somewhere like um, a far northern latitude where it doesn't get dark in the winter and we right. have these like long days and really short nights. And in the winter, the opposite, you have to use a little bit of engineering, right? Like blue right. blockers, blackout curtains, because you're not going to just like only sleep for like an hour a day. Like right. if, you, if you were timed up to those cycles, it probably would not bring you optimal health. And you might go, there's a lot of actual like insanity in those countries. Like just yeah. a little side note, like there, there's a lot of bipolar and a lot of manic, um, uh, episodes of people in those countries. So there, yeah, I mean, yeah there's something to that, it's but good. <laughs> I'm pretty happy here in the 33rd latitude here in Georgia. It's reasonable. Uh, it's, it's in, in most of the U S is pretty reasonable that we can, we can do this timing of circadian biology. And so, um, Dr. Sachin Panda is, has written a lot on this as well. I think his book, the circadian code, where he really provides the data and the research of Again, how every single organ system in your body is supposed to run on a circadian timer, like our gut clock, for example. Uh, this is why eating at night can be so detrimental to your health because your gut is meant to stop functioning at in the evening and at night, right? Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to start making uh, melatonin, human growth hormone. Um, and melatonin is this master antioxidant that is responsible for cleaning up all this damage, repairing things, regenerating autophagy, apoptosis, all these, you know, benefits that biohackers talk about. Your body has the ability to do it when you are really exposing your body to proper light and dark cycles. Um, so let's go. And, can we just slow it down even more? So eating yeah. at night, let's define eating at night. Cause I think some people hear eating at night is like midnight snacking or you know, like binging with a thing of popcorn and Netflix. Or do you mean like having dinner past dark? Well, ideally you don't want to eat if the sun's not up, but we're okay. always going to get the people like, okay, I live in Canada and the sun goes down at like three in the afternoon. What do I do? So in those situations, I'm going to say in the winter time, try to have an earlier dinner. The earlier, mm -hmm. uh, earlier is better, but like five, six o'clock at night is pretty reasonable for dinner. Yeah. And then you're going to try to go to bed a little earlier in the winter, winter time, we're supposed to make more melatonin. Mm -hmm. uh, summertime, we're supposed to make more vitamin D. They're both hormones and the receptor site is actually very similar. Uh, and there's evidence that they share some receptor activity, which is pretty interesting. Um, and so, yeah. And the, in the winter time, we want to eat a little bit less, eat a little bit earlier, try to keep the dinner like four hours, three hours away from bedtime. And then in the summer, it's easier because sun goes down a bit later. Right. Um, but I still, even in the summer, try to keep my last meal, you know, three, four hours away from bedtime. Just because. And does that go for kids too? Kids are a bit more insulin sensitive. 
Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I try to, you know, with, with my kids, uh, if they are really asking for something to eat before bed, stick to something like meat and cheese, okay. um, something that's not going to spike insulin okay. and cause a big blood sugar response because, uh, insulin and leptin have a similar, uh, receptor site in the brain. And, we want leptin to be able to dock to the brain at night while you're sleeping so that this kind of like download of energy information can happen. And that's going to tell your sex hormones, your thyroid hormones, your all of these different processes in your body is going to kind of give directions to it. And if insulin is up again, insulin and leptin are going to compete for that docking space in the brain at night that usually happens between, you know, midnight and 2am. So if your insulin's up at that time, that download of information of like how much stored energy is on my body to regulate my metabolism, thyroid, sex hormones, all this stuff can't happen. And so people end up becoming leptin resistant and kids now are like little girls are having like PCOS and um, major insulin resistance, weight loss problems. I have a, you know, unfortunately I have a niece who's pre-diabetic and seven and it breaks my heart. I'm like, there's no need for this. This is just tragic. Right. And so, you know, with kids like, yeah, we, we don't want to be feeding them like chocolate milk and ice cream and probably not not even really like popcorn and stuff like that before bed. I would stick to more like meat and cheese, like something more, um, blood sugar friendly protein fat. Yeah. Yeah. And then would that affect melatonin release too? Because I have, I work with all kinds of clients whose kids just struggle like night, nighttime's just a nightmare for everybody. And so that's one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you about like melatonin release and then light and how much light affects us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we need four hours of darkness in order for the body to begin making pineal melatonin. So we make melatonin subcellularly in the mitochondria. That's about 95% of our melatonin. That's in response to infrared light. And that's a whole other conversation because most people don't get any infrared light exposure due to to our modern world, right? And so that's one issue. Most people are like not getting any infrared. And then the second issue is, yeah, we need four hours of darkness before our body can even start making that pineal melatonin. And so what are most people doing before bed? They're watching TV. They've got iPads, phone screens, overhead lights, LEDs, all these lights on. And so your, your kid's not tired because the, the brain is being told. So blue light is the timekeeper. So blue light coming in through the eyes basically tells the brain via the super chiasmatic nucleus, make cortisol. It is daytime. We need to make cortisol. That is this very simplistic way of understanding this. And so if you are in a blue, blue light enriched environment in the evening, your body is still going to think it is daytime and is still going to continue making cortisol and cortisol and melatonin oppose one another. So they cannot, um, one has to be high and the other has to be low. So in the evening time, we need to ideally stop eating the big meal um, because eating also elicits a small cortisol response. Now it's not bad. Cortisol is not evil. There's this whole cortisol thing going on. (laughs) The internet, if a little is good, more is better, right? It's a little out of control (laughs) right now with the cortisol conversations, but it's not evil. It's not bad, but just when you do eat, it does bring cortisol up a little bit, which is going to prevent melatonin. But the the huge issue again is the blue light and and what that does to prevent pineal melatonin release. And so, you know, if you have kids and what we do here, because everyone's like, oh my gosh, now what are we going to do? You know, you can take, sc- I take screens away at um, 7.30, like no more screens. Um, you know, if you do have a TV on blue blockers are really helpful. There's a cheap brand called spectra Four Seven Nine that you can get on Amazon. If you're like skeptical, you don't want to buy one of the nicer pairs like raw optics or Viva rays. Those are the really nice ones. Um, but the blue blockers are really, really helpful in, uh, allowing the body to start to shut down and uh, giving you that four hours needed for the pineal melatonin to be released and stopping that cortisol production. That's what's really, really crucial. Right. Um, so that I think is- And is, is, isn't an easy fix like red lights, right? Like putting in red light bulbs, because I find my my audience tends to be 
mm, I don't say this with like superiority, but more conscious. Like a lot of people aren't watching iPads. Their kids don't get nighttime screen time. Right. But I think people forget about the big light, the, light. the overhead lights that, you know, in these houses are cavernous. Now we have these like open concept with these bucket lights that are just shining down. So um, I know I switched out. Well, I went to KetoCon with Danny Hamilton and she took our oh whole Airbnb God. and like made it. Red I love it. I'm going to stay with her in a couple of weeks. <laughs> that's awesome. And so, yeah. yeah, we, um, and that like super helps, you know, and that's oh, a yeah. great, and I think for parents, like it's, it also signals like kids are so uh, susceptible to the Pavlovian response too, which is like, we're settling down red light mimics fire light. Right. So like, it's a cue that the whole house is settling down because mm -hmm. I think, like you said, the modern world is just crazy for parents. You know, they're coming in the door at 6 PM. Trying to get, yeah. And then it's like dinner, bath stories. Okay. Why isn't my kid tired? And you're like, Whoa, that was a train coming through the house, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and you know, my husband's finally used to it now after like four years of me changing out all the bulbs and turning out everything. He's just like, all right, I'm just, this is just what she does. Oh, um, that's my son. My son's 18 and he just, I get the eye roll. And I was like, shut yeah. up. You look good. Don't you? You feel good. Don't you? <laughs> right. Exactly. I'm like, you sleep good. You fall asleep as soon as you hit the pillow. Like it's yeah. And men are less sensitive to blue light than women. And so any of the, the lady listeners, your husband is probably going to push back on you. Um, and they are less sensitive to blue light. Dr. Scott Zimmerman, he is another one of the world's leading researchers on melatonin. He and Dr. Russell Ryder, and he has his own light bulb company. I think it's called Nira, N-I-R-A. And I need to get him on my podcast, but he, um, you know, he has his own light bulb company. So if you're looking for good uh, light bulbs that are scientists approved to change out some of your bulbs in the house, those are ones that I recommend. Um, but yeah, I mean, that it is, it is something that, and he's the one who says that women are more sensitive to blue light. So if you, I'm, I'm the one who, if someone turns on a big overhead light, I'm like, <gasps> and I've always been that way. Like before I even started doing this stuff, I've always been like super grossed out by like bright led overhead lights. Like they almost make me want to throw up. Me too, um, but I'm just vain. They make you look crappy. Oh, they do make you look terrible. I like the, I like the airbrushing of the soft light. <laughs> Oh, I know me too. Um, yeah, but that's women are more sensitive to, to the blue light. Okay. So I want to come at this, like for those of you listening, so moms listen to this. Okay. Because what is the biggest thing that I rally against in this podcast is quote unquote me time after the kids go to bed, mm -hmm. that you binge television and, mm -hmm. or you're on your phone doing research, signing up for camps, but you're in bed with your phone. This yep. is affecting your sleep. And the best thing you can do is put those blue blockers on if you've got to, but honestly, log off. Log yeah. off. Like it's because you're still gonna have dopamine going. Yeah. And dopamine blocks melatonin also. Yep, yep, yep. And so, that your me time, even though it's you're not conscious of it, the best me time you can have is great sleep. Cause yeah. then you're energized in the morning. And here's a little hack. I don't know if I'll like offend some people by saying this, but like <laughs> you can hop over the four hours of darkness um by stimulating oxytocin production. So breastfeeding moms. Uh, don't look at your phone when you're breastfeeding because that's going to stop oxytocin production. And you are able, cause I, I get breastfeeding moms a lot. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm breastfeeding. My sleep is wrecked. I'm like, you have a biological biohack built in when you're breastfeeding, you're making oxytocin and you can fall asleep and start making melatonin immediately without that four hours of darkness needed. Um, so if you have to wake up at night and breastfeed, do not look at your phone, wear some blue blockers, keep the lights, you know, use the blue blocking bulbs and you're going to be able to go right back to sleep. You don't need that four hours. Right. Yeah. Um, or, you know, if, your husband, partner. I was like, going to say, there's a lot of leeway here in the, well, you know, <laughs> or, you know, you, you do that. Like, <laughs> are you saying sex and nipple stimulation might help I, your sleep too? I'll yes. say the word so you don't have to. <laughs> you, yes. Still wear your blue blockers, but like, we'll get to it, ladies. <laughs> this could be super, super helpful. Uh, so yeah. that's a great hack though. Like if you feel like, oh my God, I'm I need to get to sleep. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. So we have meal timing, which is really for, for adults, especially women try to get, you know, to, don't be eating like 
before three or four hours, you know, stop eating three or four hours before bedtime. For kids, if they have to have a snack, something like protein and fat, then we have red lights to help release the melatonin, right? And then you said, I know infrared light is a whole nother subject, but is infrared light the light in the morning? Is that? We have infrared from daybreak until nightfall. So even before sunrise, there is like an abundance of red and near infrared. It's actually blue light begins to become, uh, come on the horizon at sunrise. And so okay. uh, you can get tons of red and near infrared uh, all day long, really, but it's really going to be most rich and abundant, like right before sunrise and at sunrise time, uh, before UV even comes online. And then in the evening at sunset and after sunset, like nightfall, but we have infrared available from literally night sun, like daybreak, even before sunrise to nightfall. So all you need to do to get infrared is go outside. And then you can also Zimmerman, again, the scientist I mentioned earlier, he and Ryder did a study that basically showed you can get infrared when you're sitting in the shade and uh, sunlight bounces off of green leaves, trees, and plants to your skin and infrared can penetrate through your skin. So you don't have to be naked to get infrared. Um, so literally just going outside, you're getting infrared light. And this is making that subcellular melatonin. So I liken it to like a mother who is kind of going around the house, like picking up socks all day. That's what is it was going on for your cells, for the health of your mitochondria. Like you're, you're pumping this melatonin, this master antioxidant and making more exclusion zone water by going out, getting this natural light on your skin. And you don't have to be in the middle of the day with a really strong UV, which can, you know, have its own issues. If you're not used to it, you can do it in the morning, in the evening, just any time of day. Um, and then you're going to make this subcellular melatonin. So when you get to sleep, the pineal melatonin can really do its job and really, really uh, support cellular health and and really regenerate and and help you repair all the damage that's happened during the day. But during the day, just getting infrared on your skin is going to help with that night's sleep as well. And then one more thing about melatonin, you actually make uh, your when when those aromatic amino acids in your eyes capture photons from light in UVA, which happens right after sunrise, you are making serotonin, which is recycled into that night's melatonin. So the serotonin that you make in the morning is used that evening to make pineal melatonin. So mm. if you can get your kids outside in the morning, especially, you know, just not super strong UV. So you don't have to necessarily be worried about the sunburn and the sun damage at that time of day. Yeah. That, not at sunrise. Yeah. 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 My kids, like as, when I get up in the morning, we have a beautiful, like little screened in patio, which I love. The door is open. The kids come out on the patio with me. We eat breakfast out there. We hang out out there. We hear the birds. It's just like a really lovely way to start the day. I take the dog in the yard. We do some grounding. And um, that morning time is very sacred. We don't do screens, TV, mm -hmm. don't turn on like a bunch of overhead lights because I want this like natural hormone production to start for myself and for the kids in the morning is so important to do it that way. Yeah. And, the, and so people like, and you're not supposed to wear sunglasses or sunscreen, right? Cause I know everybody, everybody has differing, differing opinions on the sun. I like the sun. I sit out in the sun, <laughs> obviously. Okay. Um, but that morning light, it's really key that you don't have sunglasses on or sunscreen, right? Because you really yeah. want that. I call it the colostrum of sunlight. It is. Right? Cause I, yeah, because oh, I always, I I'm, a, I I'm a hunter now. and I'm also, um, my dog needs to get out on the trails before everybody else. I live in the middle of the woods. So oh like we get out and so I'm so acclimated to that slow, like we go out in the dark and you see the sun start to oh, come out it. and then... Yeah. Yeah. So I thought moving to the woods just lowered my cortisol because I don't have neighbors. I don't hear siren. Like I don't hear anything. So I wake jealous. up to trees, but now I'm realizing like from following you that probably I'm getting all these other things just quite accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a reason why that we grew up really connect. I mean, our, our civilization kind of came to be very connected to light and dark cycles to nature we had fire you know but the electric light bulb wasn't invented you know <laughs> and electricity was just the last couple hundred years right yeah yeah and you know there's some people say that that's when a lot of mo you know these modern diseases began and accelerated 
I think there's so many other factors just besides the light, but there is an interesting correlation to different cancers and these artificial lights. Um, yeah. And then the incandescent bulbs now are being phased out uh, completely and illegal in some places. And as all LEDs and fluorescents are the only thing you can buy, the energy efficient bulbs, and those have no infrared. Yeah. And so incandescent bulbs still have infrared. And those were actually the bulbs that were used by Dr. Gerald Pollack, who's done all the research on exclusion zone water, which is what our body is comprised like 99% of this, you know, exclusion zone water. He showed just by exposing this, this exclusion zone water to an infrared light bulb uh, that it expanded up to fourfold. And so you increase the, the amount of exclusion zone water in your body when you expose your body to infrared. And we have zero indoors because our windows are so energy efficient because if we allowed infrared to come in through the glass, our houses would overheat, right? Right. Um, and so we're, again, we're in these environments where we're making no subcellular melatonin during the day. And then we're blocking the production of pineal melatonin at night through our indoor modern lives. And it's something that, is an easy fix. You go outside, you change some light bulbs out, you get darkness at night. It's, a, it's such an easy, simple fix, but it's being completely overlooked and missed. And I think to the detriment of so many people, because just going back to the original story that we were talking about, that is how I ended up getting pregnant and giving birth at age 43 was changing my light and dark uh, signaling. Essentially, I did do some, a lot of grounding, cold plunging, time out in nature, red light therapy, but that I put under the umbrella of quantum health strategies as well. Not necessarily mm -hmm. biohacking, but more quantum health strategies. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, and I've had so many women. I have a woman now in my community who's on her second pregnancy doing these protocols with me and being a part of my group. Um, and yeah. she had previously like multiple miscarriages, failed IVF, and she just did these things. And now she's pregnant with her second uh, baby. These are such easy, diagnosed. you know, I love that these are easy fixes, but I love too that they're like, like I just got like this glowing feeling in my heart when you talked about your sacred morning. Like, and I just keep trying to get parents to slow down with their kids because we're just going at breakneck speed. Anxiety yeah. in kids is so high, seeing dramatic behaviors. Um, and so just the idea of like, let's go out and put our bare feet in the grass. Like what, what an easy activity. And so for like the busy moms, if you're listening to this, don't get caught up. Sarah, Sarah, you're fucking so knowledgeable about, about this. I'm going to have to look up so many things after we get off. But I mean, I feel like if I keep asking you, we'll be here for seven hours, but I think, you know, I think let's go through these like really easy strategies. Cause I'm the kind of person like that's even how I happened upon carnivore is when I first heard of it, I was like, Oh my God, these people, are you fucking Crazy. kidding me? No vegetables. Like, come on. And then Amber O'Hearn, I heard her say, um, try it for 30 days. You won't, you won't die. You won't, you know, and I tried it for 30 days and so much pain and weird things mm -hmm. were alleviated. Mm -hmm. So like, let's give parents some like easy things because maybe they'll jump in and be like, I feel better. Now I want to learn why. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would just start with trying to get yourself and your kids out there in the morning and you don't have to be perfect about it. Uh, my partner, Carrie Bennett, she's got three kids. And she, when she first started this, it was the dead of winter and she lives in Michigan, which is pretty close to Canada is freezing cold. There's snow on the ground, like cold and she literally would just open her door and stick her head out for 30 second intervals in the morning. And that's how she really started was in the dead of winter doing this stuff. And it doesn't take, like I said, it's quantum. So it's a very small signal that yields a large result. Um, and it does build up. It is cumulative. So you can get two minutes here, two minutes here, two minutes here. You don't have to go out there and be out. I mean, ideally you're out there for a solid amount of time we got kids jobs, but we're busy. We have things we have to do. So do what you can and start to build on that. And I find that people, they start to feel better quickly. And I've got school teachers doing this, you know, that are stuck in classrooms all day. They have found out ways to bioengineer this a little bit. You have to get clever. Yeah. And it's like, I hear that a lot as I don't have time. I don't have time. And I thank God that my dog just happens to be reactive to other dogs. And so I have to get him out early because it doesn't matter if it's a blizzard, he needs, he needs five miles. Okay, so yeah. I'm out there doing that no matter what, but 
you know, I have to, because otherwise he'll be up my ass all day and I'm not willing to do that either. You know? <laughs> um, so the get outside is the most important switching out the lights. Let's talk really quickly about seasonal food, light codes in food. What is that all about? I mean, it, it all is like such common sense when you really think about it, but our food contains the information about the time of day, the time of year, where we are on the planet. Um, and when you kind of geotag yourself to that by doing circadian biology, understanding and following light and dark cycles, you start to realize like food is the same thing. It's a signature of, again, where you are on the planet, what is growing locally and seasonally to you, what is available to you at this time of year and what is not. Should we be, uh, I think we kind of intuitively know that we shouldn't be eating a bunch of processed uh, foods with, you know, all these different ingredients. Uh, there's a whole other conversation about deuterium that can be had around that. Dr. Laszlo Boris is a good, uh, good person to look, look at for that. But like, just on a very simple level, if there are like tomatoes growing out of my garden, I should eat them when they're growing. I should not necessarily try to eat tomatoes um, when they're not growing in the middle of like December. And plus like, they don't really even like taste that. They don't taste good. They're expensive. And this is part of like, I preach this a lot here on this podcast is that's where we get into overload. Like I, I don't like nightshades because it can affect my arthritis. So if I'm having tomatoes year round, that's going to make it worse. Oxalates. We're not supposed to have spinach all year all long. Round. And if you grow it yourself, you get like, you know, you get like five handfuls because and then by the time you cook it down, right? Yeah. Yeah, and or I have like a woman who's like, right now we're going to binge on blueberries and then blueberries right. are done. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, there's a woman that just did my practitioner leptin course and she had suffered with severe autoimmune disease for years and years. And she's done carnivore. That's how she found me also is carnivore. And now she's able to eat these like small amounts of nightshades that are growing where she lives seasonally to her. She doesn't go eat pounds of them. She can eat a little bit of them, but these used to give her debilitating pain with rheumatoid mm -hmm. arthritis uh, and swelling. And now she can handle small amounts of them when they are in season. And so it's like, a, it's just a barcode of like the time of year uh, and time of day too, because we're not supposed to be eating, like our gut clock is supposed to stop um, slow down so that we can repair and heal. Our gut lining is supposed to recycle every three days or so. I saw this, like, I think it was like Dr. Axe was like, your gut, gut lining re recycles every three days and your bones regenerate. Da, da, da. And he was like talking about how amazing the human body is. But guess what doesn't happen? Any of that stuff doesn't happen if you are like surrounding yourself with a bunch of blue light, your body's making a bunch of cortisol and you don't get to make enough melatonin for this regenerative process to happen. Right. That's great. That's what our human body is capable of doing, but it's not happening for people clearly, or we wouldn't be so sick. And so- Right. We need to get out of the way. And I remember when I first heard about like food has a light code and I thought, wow, that's really out there, hippy dippy. And then like the more I thought about it, I was like, well, I always preach sense. local and seasonal because it teaches you what to eat eat local and seasonal. And I live in New England. And guess what? In February, we're having root vegetables that have been stored in the cellar yeah. and meat that maybe yes. was preserved, you know? Yeah. And so I think we do go through these feasts and famines in the modern yeah. grocery store. We're we just don't to. feel like it, you know? We're supposed to fast. We're supposed to, we're not supposed to be like in a, an eternal summer. And that's essentially what we have created in our modern society is eternal summer. Well, the whole eat the rainbow year round, that's not logistically no. possible in most places. No, it's not. It doesn't make sense. You know, we're not supposed to be in this like a perpetual, like full harvest of abundance all the time. Our bodies are meant to fast and are meant to be fat adapted and go into ketosis. It's a, people will say, oh, it's, it's so dangerous. No, it's something we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to do it year round. Um, but it, we are supposed to be able to kind of pump the brakes sometimes push, push the gas, uh, with the metabolism. And that's a right. sign of a healthy metabolism. You can burn fat for fuel when needed in times of like less food. And then also in, in the, in the times of like the, the abundance, the harvest, yeah, burn sugar for fuel, glucose for fuel. So it's not like has to, it doesn't have to be this like dogmatic thing. Like I was doing in carnivore. I think like 
at about a year, my body was like, okay, we've been fasting. We've been in ketosis for like a year now. So like, obviously we're in this like famine. So we're just going to push your thyroid function down. Your sex hormones are just like all going to go to the toilet. Like, sorry. Cause like, you're just obviously, um, not, not the time to reproduce because you're clearly in a famine. Yeah. You're in a famine. Sorry. So we're just going to like downregulate these systems f- because, okay, we just, we see it as evolutionarily like necessary. So right. I don't want to demonize diets of any sort, but that's just like how our body works. And when you can look at your health through this lens of circadian biology and quantum biology, it just makes sense. It yeah, makes- it does. And I think too, if for anybody listening, this might, any part of this might sound daunting, but you know, I can attest, I used to not like to eat breakfast. Um, I like, I do intermittent fasting just naturally. I just feel like my body likes 14, 16 hours just to yeah. digest, but I normally eat like probably around two or three, but I'm up at, you know, I'm up at four 30. I'm out for the sunrise. I eat when I get home. It's always like eggs and burger or something like that. And then like naturally I just stop eating, you know, of course, if there's a party or something or a barbecue, I might eat a little later, but generally yeah. speaking, and then I'm in bed, that sun goes down, dude, it's, it's horrible for me in the winter because my melatonin, the sun goes down and I'm out. So like yeah. New England at 4 30 in the middle of winter, right? I'm like, Oh, I have to stay up. I can't go to bed at 4 30. <laughs> it's terrible, but I you, mean, can, cold you can and dark have tremendous benefits to the mitochondria right? Yeah. Cold actually shrinks the space between the respiratory proteins in the mitochondria. So we can make more water so they can be more efficient. So, uh, cold and dark are not a bad thing. And when you get further away from the equator, the further North you go, there's more magnetism. And so you can actually get more benefits of grounding and there's less UV, there's less radiation to interfere with pulling those electrons into the body. And so there's there's benefits. I get a lot. Oh, I live in Canada. I, um, I can't do anything that you say. Yeah, you can. There's cold, there's dark and there's still sun. There's still infrared. Like, so if it's raining and it's cloudy, there's a, an abundance of infrared and there's enough lux, there's enough brightness available for your brain to get the benefits that it needs for depression, anxiety, and mood and weight control, you just actually do have to go outside. Like you just can't like stay. But everybody knows this, right? Anybody who experiences winter or if you're in Portland, Oregon, and you've got, you know, 306 days of rain, you know, when the sun comes out, everybody's freaking happier. Everybody's happier. Road rage goes down, right? Like we know this. So it's, but I think we just forget and we get, we get caught in the trappings of busyness and like, I don't have time or yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Well, Sarah, this has been amazing. So I just want to reiterate, we've got meal timing, red lights and and blue blockers. We get infrared sun. That's your morning sunlight, your sunrise, your sunset. Eat seasonally, right? And those are the easiest things you can do. Those are the huge dial movers, right? Yeah. Yeah. And for your kids too. For your kids too. Yeah. (laughs) They're not, they're not separated off from this information. It benefits them as well. And they are more little sensitive humans. to light. Yeah. John Ott has a little thing you can watch on um, YouTube called health and light. And they did all this, these experiments with children and saw their behaviors change under these bright fluorescent lights. I mean, they saw it in real, it's real, it's legitimate. And you, you might even notice it with your kids. They act crazy. If you give them a bunch of screens and turn a bunch of overhead fluorescent lights on, they act crazy. Why? I mean, because it's going against their biology and it's bringing up cortisol, dopamine, all these things that we're not meant to have elevated all the time. Yeah. 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 And again, I think a lot of parents now are really recognizing like no screens at night, but I think everybody forgets about the fluorescent lighting, the led lighting, the overhead lights. Yeah. For sure. All well, just based on this conversation, I can say you're going to ace your board exams because you I just like so. brrr, rattled off a bunch of information. <laughs> so tell people where they can find you. And you have like a lot of offerings. You have like a leptin course, right? Yeah, I have a 21 day leptin reset course. That's basically like a blueprint of how to put all this together for you, nutrition, light, uh, based on where you live, all that stuff. Um, So that's like really my signature course. I have people start there if they want to take some of my classes. And then I have a ton of free eBooks also. Um, So if you are new to this, you just want to get your feet wet, just go to sarahkleinerwellness.com and then check out my free resources. You can get any of those. There's like 13 free eBooks on there. 
everything from hydration to uh, blue blockers, how to use them appropriately to, uh, there's a ton of information. Nice. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time today to chat with me. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. And as always, you guys, I appreciate you listening. Rock on and have a beautiful day. Okay. Bye everyone. Just a reminder, if you need additional resources, I have Oh Crap Potty Training. I have Oh Crap, I Have a Toddler. Those books are available everywhere you want to find a book. (laughs) You can also go to my website, jamieglowacki.com, where you can book private sessions with me, buy any of my courses. Those are really geared towards potty training help. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, jamie.glowacki, and I do a lot of lives and uh, usually posting a lot of good information. So those are extra resources for you. And as always, rock on. Have an awesome day.